I went to graduate school with, uh, with an interest in urban history. Um, but I had, the project I proposed was something completely unrelated to what I ended up doing. Um, I was interested, uh, the project I proposed was something I had done as an undergraduate was looking at, uh, was basically an intellectual history project um, looking at uh, black college students who attended predominantly white institutions. And I thought I might study that, that cohort of people, um, Adam Clayton Powell and Paul Robeson, and these sort of various pioneers from the kind of early part of the 20th century. But I abandoned that project almost immediately as I set foot on campus at Yale and I was sort of floundering around for a topic but I, my other primary interest um, coming into graduate school was in urban history. I had written an undergraduate thesis uh, on Detroit uh, about around the Afrocentric uh, school movement in the early 1990s. I'm um, trying to look at the kind of history of black education in Detroit and how this kind of coincides with this discourse around the endangered black male of the late 80s and the early 90s. Um, that there was this proposal some of you may remember or would have heard of these proposals uh, and in some places these were instituted as single sex academies, um, either black male and in some cases black girls. The situation in Detroit, well that's a, a tangent in any case. So that was sort of my interest uh, in, in, in urban history was sort of fostered as an undergraduate. So I, I, I was looking around for a topic. And I, I was in sort of in conjunction with that, I was also interested in migration, right? Sort of difficult to think about African American urbanization and not also think about migration simultaneously. Um, <clears throat> And as I sort of survey, what would you do as a kind of first and second year grad student? They, you know, your advisor sort of sends you out to you know look at the literature. Um, and what I found at that time um, was a real disparity in terms of how uh, historians, in particular, had written about Black migration, African American migration. Um, almost all kind of major works that I came across uh, that had been published up through the, let's say, the mid-90s focused on the earlier period, focused on what some historians call the first great migration, right? starting in World War I, going into the interwar period. And a little bit, sort of smattering of, of, of pieces written uh, that, that focused on the later period, but demographically, three times as many people at least uh, leave the South uh, from World War II forward uh, than leave in that earlier period, uh, that leave during the war. Um, but yet all this literature had sort of clustered around the 19-teens and the 1920s, which were clearly transformative moments. Um, but it left me thinking about that later time period. And, and, and in particular, what struck me was a certain kind of paradox. Right? If we think about the mid 20th century, the 1950s and 60s as, as the kind of apex of the modern civil rights movement, right? when these tremendous uh, kinds of transformations are, are taking hold in the South, that's also the time when the most numbers of African Americans are leaving the South to the North. Right? So how should we think about those two things together? Um, those two phenomena really as related in some kind of way. Maybe they're not. Maybe, maybe, maybe they, maybe they were, uh, you know, these are sort of parallel phenomena. But uh, the historian to me tends to tend, tend to just sort of think otherwise, and I want to explore that uh, in some in some depth. I thought I might write about New York. Uh, I was in New Haven, so New York was was proximate. I had an interest in New York, um, but I also wanted very consciously to move away from Harlem. Um, because the other thing that I noticed in surveying the literature, um, you know, again, this is up to the, to sort of the, the late 90s, early 2000s, um, you look at the kind of history of black New York, which is what you're doing here in this institute, um, books on Harlem, books on everywhere else, right? But, as you saw in the, in the chapter um, that I gave you, um, there's, there's a real shift, a demographic shift that's happening in New York City around the black population that I suggest starts in the interwar period, but really accelerates from World War II forward. Um, and, it, and, it's, and there's two parts of it. Uh, one is simply a kind of geographical shift. People are moving, either moving out of Harlem or simply bypassing Harlem altogether. And these new migrants are coming to the city. They're moving to other parts of, of, of the city. They're moving to Queens a little bit. That, that happens more later. Uh, but Brooklyn and the Bronx in particular. 1930s, 1940s, 50s, absolutely. So this is happening, right? And so, so, but even so, the literature kind of suggests that black New York is synonymous with Harlem, right? And so this is something that, I, so I figured I would, I would focus on Brooklyn. I'd also had a kind of personal experience. I'm, I'm from Boston originally, so I don't have any New York roots, and I also don't have any West Indian roots. People always ask me those two questions. Are you from Brooklyn? Are you, are you West Indian? Um, but I had a friend who was from there, Full disclosure, my college sweetheart was from Bedford Stuyvesant, uh, and I remember going to visit her for the first time. And my experience in New York up to that point um, had really only been in in, in, New York, in Manhattan. 
uh, Midtown and a little bit in Harlem. Um, and I remember the very first time that I, that I went to Bed-Stuy um, and I got out of the A train at Utica Avenue uh, and I emerged and the first thing I remember is there's like sunlight, right? It's just bright. The, 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 the kind of uh, scale of the housing so much lower than I had been accustomed to in Midtown. Um, so that was just sort of remarkable. You know, Fulton Street's fairly wide. The, you know, the tallest buildings at that time were probably five or six story tenements uh, and then brownstones, three, story, three and four story brownstones. But the other question immediately that popped into my mind spending that afternoon there, how did all these black people get to be in these brownstone homes? Right? And so that sort of became the impetus for thinking about this area of what, what, I'm, what, what is essentially north central Brooklyn as a focal point for my research. Um, so, so the project at that point was you know, black southerners moving to New York. My, 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 my girlfriend's family, uh, her, their roots were from were in South Carolina, mainly South Carolina and Georgia. So that was the, the kind of story that I was sort of trying to track a little bit. Uh, but immediately in doing you know, further research, it became obvious that, you, that I couldn't tell the story of, of, of black Brooklyn in the 20th century as a US, a US exclusive story, right? As a, as an Af US African American story, right? There were just too many people of Caribbean descent you know, in the picture. Um, and as, our, as I sort of suggest to you, in the, as I suggest in this chapter, right, it's not that there are, um, you know, West Indians over here, African Americans over here, and they're sort of living in some type of proximity, right? They're living literally side by side. They're living in the same buildings. They're living on the same blocks. Uh, and so I had to try to, un I wanted to try to unravel what that actually meant. Right? It's not just the fact of it, but what does it mean for identity? What does it mean uh, for how people think of themselves? Uh, what does it mean for the kinds of affiliations uh, that they may um, adopt at any particular time? Um, and so starting to think then about uh, histories of Caribbean migration and immigration um, then opened up a whole different, different framework for me. Uh, and then it became a, a, a project that, was, that is both comparative and transnational. And that's something that I try to emphasize uh, quite a bit. Um, so there was a moment, uh, a moment an ill-fated moment in which this project was going to be uh, New York and Toronto in London. Uh, and the wisdom of my dissertation advisor was like, you know, she said, that's, that's impossible, right? Three cities, three, three countries, you know, two plus empires. I mean, you just can't, you can't do that as, as a graduate student. Um, so it became London and, and New York. But for me, I was, I, you know, part, of, part going back to my earlier explorations in urban history, in part, I think it's just my own kind of uh, disposition. I wanted it to also be a local story. Right, and, and so this is one of the things that I've had to struggle with, and I'll be curious to hear what you think of the chapter, right, how to actually tell really big stories, right, big stories about, about big demographic shifts, about big political um, developments and movements, um, about these, these, these large phenomena. I, I talked a few moments ago about the great migration against the backdrop of civil rights. The book itself might be thought of as, uh, as black migrations, plural, against the backdrop of civil rights, black power, and decolonization. Right, so the book starts in the interwar period. Um, this chapter I gave you is chapter two. There's a, there's a chapter that comes before that's kind of setting the, setting the stage and, and sort of looking at what's happening in the Caribbean, what's happening in the US South. You know, that's sort of, what are the conditions from which people end up leaving? Um, and so it starts in the interwar period and carries through, uh, through the 1970s. Um, so it's about 50 years, roughly, um, uh, this, this story. So this is a, that's a big story. You know, again, these two, two really different kinds of cities. Um, so how to tell that, how to make that manageable? For me, part of what attracts me to history is, is storytelling, right, and personal narratives. Uh, and, and you see in the chapter that I draw really heavily on people's personal narratives. I interviewed. I, when I started out the project, I thought I was going to, it would be primarily based on oral histories. I thought I'd do, you know, 50, 60, 75 oral histories, and that would sort of be the basis of that. I would interview people in the UK, I would interview people on this side, maybe in the, even in the Caribbean, and, you know, that would, and that also just became kind of untenable just from, sort of from a practical standpoint. Um, but I did interview probably two dozen or so people, uh, again, both in London and, and, uh, and here. Um, but as well, I drew upon oral history collections all over, and I'm happy to talk about some of those collections if, if people are interested. Um, so 
that was just kind of a useful um, strategy that you know that I, that I still had those personal narratives, um, people's firsthand accounts of, of what occurred and their, their experiences, but I didn't necessarily have to go out and get them myself. You know, those were already sort of waiting for me in the archive, as it were. Um, but to tell this this really expansive story, these two different cities, these two empires, um, I wanted to keep it at what's essentially the neighborhood level, right? So this 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 book really focuses on this area of, of central Brooklyn. Those of you who are New Yorkers or Brooklynites, um, you, you know it fairly well. It's it's Bed Stuy, Crown Heights, and um, let's see if this nah too easy. Um, Plug into your laptop. Oh, I see. There's no, there's no, it's there's no flash drive inside here. But maybe it's around somewhere. Oh, I see. Yeah, you want to just just yank it out. What's the worst that could happen? All right, do I do something? Okay. Uh, yeah. Uh, I think it's taking a minute to pair with this. All right. We'll we'll keep working on that. I think it's it's trying to it's trying to sort itself out. Identify key next to the shift could be anything. Uh, might be. Might. Right, if you want to try this one? This, this is. I assume these are two different ones, right? Yeah. Thank you. That's okay. It's okay. I just. Um, this is a new computer. I haven't gotten a, a remote for it. Old from this is from the previous one, right? It's the same. This is the same oh, this issue. Is, this is here. identifying. Hold on. Is it? Please press the key immediately to the right of the shift key, which is does not exist. What about the Z? Oh, too easy. Uh, can, I, can I skip that? Select the keyboard tight. Beautiful, beautiful. Thank you. Yeah, we're good. Thank you. Um, just very quickly. So, of course, you all are. Most of you, probably all of you, are familiar with this this image, right, from Jacob Lawrence's migration series, right? That's kind of one of the iconic images. So this is a, this is sort of represents me, sort of at the early stages of this project, thinking about this again as this kind of domestic African American migration story. Um, great. So. Brooklyn, right, moving from Harlem, thinking about Brooklyn. Um, so, it's a little difficult to read here. Uh, so we got, ooh, pretty. Um, so, this is, this is Bed Stuy, Bedford Stuyvesant. Um, so, this, this is called North Central Brooklyn, or maybe just North Brooklyn. Um, so, I'm interested really in, in this area, which you can see is, is quite expansive. Um, and then Crown Heights, and the, the kind of border region here. Just, um, the borders, of course, of all neighborhoods, and particularly New York neighborhoods, shift quite a bit. Um, you know, barring sort of natural landmarks like Central Park, um, but, but, but what constitutes any particular neighborhood at any particular historical time is actually always uh, up for debate. But in any case, um, this, is the, this is the area that I'm talking about. Um, so Manhattan is sort of more or less up here, and Queens is out here. And you get it. Um, so really trying to, trying to, and this is the concentration, of course, of, of black, uh, black Brooklyn, right? There, there are uh, pockets here for, this is downtown Brooklyn, so there are, there are pockets, historical pockets here. This area called Weeksville, um, some of you will be familiar with, of course, right? This 19th century settlement of free African Americans. Um, and, and now, you know, what is, you know, now black Brooklyn, of course, is much different from the period that I'm talking about in this, in this piece. Um, so, so that's, that was sort of part of my interest, is really sort of focusing on these neighborhoods. The other thing that I tried to do once I started thinking about, uh, about London, or about the UK, uh, was to try to shift 
um, the historiography on that side, shift the, 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 make an intervention in the, in the, in the scholarship on that side. Um, the Empire Windrush is this kind of iconic moment in black British history and sort of in, in, in the kind of rise of multicultural Britain as it's, as it's often referred. Um, this is this ship that arrives in June of 1948 uh, to, to England with roughly 500 passengers uh, coming from Jamaica. They're not all Jamaicans, but the majority of them are. Um, and for many people, not so much in that exact moment, but certainly in the sort of several years and certainly the decade and a half or so after, this kind of signals the beginning of a kind of black presence in England, in the UK. Um, that's the dominant story, and, and as I suggest in the chapter, again, um, you know, there's a, that allies a much longer history of, of the black presence in England, um, a, a 2,000 year history of the black presence in England, frankly. Um, but th having said that, and having made that acknowledgement, it is also the case um, that something does start to happen in the late 1940s, sort of starting around this period with, with the arrival of this ship. Um, and that is, that is a settlement of a new community, right? Uh, uh, not the kind of disparate community of, 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 of servants and a few artists and artisans and, 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 and writers, right? But a, but a, wor a kind of robust working class uh, Caribbean immigrant community. Um, and they settle in a couple of places. If you had a chance to look at the, 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 the Siri Peach piece, um, that sort of takes us a little bit through that history of where folks settle. Um, so this is a, a, a kind of equivalent map of, of, of London, um, the River Thames, uh, which uh, divides North and South London. Um, the borough of Lambeth is where Brixton is. I'm sure many, most of you have heard of Brixton. So that becomes really kind of a focal point early on of the, of the Caribbean immigrant community, particularly the Jamaican community. Um, and I chose to focus on this area of West London, what is now the borough of Kensington and Chelsea, um, and which, which is where Notting Hill is located. And Notting Hill becomes a kind of um, an emblem, right, for a, for a larger community, right? So Notting Hill proper is sort of located here, but it sort of stands in for a kind of broader West London community. Um, and so trying to shift again a little of the conversation away from strictly Brixton um, and sort of think about what's happening in West London. I can talk a little bit more about what's happening in Notting Hill, why I chose that neighborhood. Um, yes. So. Just very quickly, let me sort of take you through the architecture of the book, and then uh, we'll talk a little bit about performance and sort of why I want us to, to, to focus on performance, and then let's have a conversation about the readings and the stuff I circulated, and then we'll end by talking about how you actually teach any of the stuff, or how you might implement this, or where you might go for, for some further resources. Um, so as I said, the first chapter really kind of sets the stage by, by um, by talking about the conditions in these places. When I wrote the dissertation, um, I had set out, as I explained to you, to tell this history of migration. I was going to tell this history of how sort of black Brooklyn kind of came into being, both African American and then West Indians. Uh, but oddly enough, as I started writing, and particularly as I got to the end of the dissertation and looked back and I had to write an intro and a conclusion, I realized I'd almost completely skipped the migration story itself. I basically started with people arriving or in the place, right? That, the, the, actually, the first chapter of the dissertation starts essentially in 19. 45 with the, the World War II stuff that's in this chapter around the kind of uh, labor issues. And I actually hadn't said hardly a word about how, how and why people decided to leave the places that they left to come there. So I had to go back and, and try to write that. And so these first two chapters are trying to, trying to do, that, do that work. Another thing that I found in sort of surveying the scholarship and where I'm, where I, where I'm trying to make a difference in, with this book is um, in, in looking at the history or the, or the scholarship, I should say the history of the scholarship on, um, on Caribbean immigration to, to the U.S. and sort of Caribbean New York in particular, uh, I was struck by two things. One, um, the preponderance of, of social science literature relative to historical or, or, or um, other kinds of uh, humanities work. And the focus in that social science literature uh, on conflict, conflict between African Americans and Caribbean folks. Uh, I'm, I'm, and again, I'm sort of talking about the scholarship that's uh, of the 1970s and 80s in particular. Um, so socio sociological literature, anthropo anthropological literature um, that focuses on competition and conflict, right? And so it's a kind of narrative that um, of, of Caribbean resentment of African Americans and vice versa. Uh, of, and, and part of it, I think, is really overdetermined by um, 
part of it is to show the, the kind of models that social scientists tend to use, uh, and, and which I think are a little bit different, or ways of approaching questions are certainly different from, from the kinds of history, the kind of social history that I, that I prefer and that I, that I want to write. Um, part of it, I think, is, was overdetermined by the kind of Du Bois, Garvey, A. Philip Randolph conflicts of the, of the 1920s, right? Um, so I want to try to acknowledge some some basis for those conflicts in this book, but I'm actually more interested in moments of solidarity. I'm, I'm more interested in, in, in how and why and under what conditions people come together, or how and why and under what conditions people um, might uh, place their national identity, um, they, they might subvert their national identity to their racial identity, say, or their ethnic identity to their, to their racial identity. You know, let me put it, I put it another way. When is blackness, as opposed to Trinidadianness or Americanness, right? The kind of more salient operative identity. Um, and so, for for the book, I look at racial violence as a as a key site. Police brutality and racial violence. And so, the, the chapter that follows from this one, chapter three, um, is all about police brutality in New York, uh, in Brooklyn, in particular, in the 1940s and 50s, the post-war period. Um, and this will probably not surprise you. Um, that you know, a, a Trinidadian identity, a Jamaican accent, really didn't do you much good when it came to interactions with the NYPD in the 1940s and 50s, or even before. Um, but what I, what I, the, 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 the gist of the chapter though is really about how uh, police brutality becomes this really salient issue in the 1940s in New York, and a kind of a, a cornerstone of the post-war civil rights movement in the city. Um, that it brings together churches, labor groups, uh, civil rights groups, of course, like the NAACP, um, communists, um, a whole range of people are organizing around this issue because people see this as an issue that affects everybody in the black community, right? Not just one particular segment, you know, based on class, based on gender, based on national origin. In chapter four, I do similar work in London, but rather than focusing on the police, uh, there was issues with the police, but actually uh, a, a, a much uh, more difficult and, and strenuous, uh, or, or much more difficult issue was um, was what we would think of as sort of extra legal racial violence. Um, so, so the so. Um, in 1958, there's this kind of racial conflagration in, the, in London um, that becomes known as the Notting Hill Riots, the 1958 riots, or the anti-black riots. So mobs of whites attack working class uh, Caribbean immigrants uh, around West London um, over a course of about four days. Um, and it's kind of a moment, I argue, where um, suddenly Britain has to kind of really grapple with its own kind of racial history and its own imperial history in a, in a particular kind of way. Um, you know, there have there had been sort of some issues and, and conversations nationally within the national government and sort of in the national press up to that point, but, it, but 1958 is like this kind of this flashpoint uh, in which um, suddenly at the highest levels of government, within parliament, within the home office, there, is these, there are these discussions about well, you know, these, these former Brit these British subjects, right, these former colonial subjects, or still colonial subjects, um, have free passage. They're allowed to travel back and forth. They, they have British passports, right? But, whoa, do we really want them here? Like, is this really what, eh, you know? And there's some, some major hand-wringing around that. But, it, but it's tied to this very localized kind of violence, right? So I'm trying to make this connection between these local events in this one particular neighborhood and these national discourses around race and, and, and anti-black violence. The flip side of, of these, issue, these, these um, um, moments of violence, uh, I'm, I'm arguing, um, have to do with the ways that uh, people resist, um, and particularly the ways that people um, make claims to the streets. So I argue in chapter five, that the emergence of West Indian Carnival uh, in, in New York, but in particular uh, in London, the emergence of West Indian Carnival, which uh, with, it starts here in New York in 1947, um, it starts in the UK in the, uh, in the uh, late 1950s, right after these riots, um, become, becomes a kind of assertion to public space, assertion to the right to public space, right? For black people to be on the streets, and, and the carnival in London actually um, it starts off indoors for about five years, but eventually in the mid-1960s it moves outdoors to where it is today in West London uh, around the area of Notting Hill. Um, and I'm suggesting that that is deliberate. 
it's clearly deliberate, and we, and we look at the archives, um, that people want to be in this very same space where they had been routed out just a few years before. And as it grows, it starts with just a few hundred people, and then a few thousand, and it goes through a lull, and then in the mid-1970s, it kind of explodes into hundreds of thousands. And today, it's often called the largest street festival in Europe. Um, somewhere between a million to two million, two million people come out for the Notting Hill Carnival over two days or over, the, over a weekend. Um, and so in this 1970s moment where it, where it explodes in size, people, uh, local neighbors and, and the police and, um, and, and local government say, this is too big, we can't handle this in the streets, this needs to be somewhere else. Uh, we should move it to Hyde Park, right, the sort of equivalent of Central Park, big open space. We should move it to a, a, a football stadium and can just dance around in the stadium and just all be contained right there. Um, but the, tradi the tradition of Carnival, um, you know, from its origins uh, in, in Trinidad and sort of the parallel origins of course, in, in Rio and elsewhere in New Orleans, right, is outdoors, right? It's not. It's, it's not about containment, right? It's about being in the streets. Um, and if, and again, in the UK, there's a there's a particular connection between between uh, being in, in those streets as as the site where this this anti-black violence occurred. <laughs> All right, very quickly, just to take you through the very end of the book, and then we'll we'll get back to the matters at hand. Um, in the the, the Two of, the, two, of the, two of the final three chapters are focused on black power and sort of thinking about this transition now in, in, um, in these two sites, right, of a generation now in, in, in terms of the Britain, it's a generation that's now coming of age in the UK, right, so rather than a migrant generation, this is a generation that either migrated as children or was born there, born in the UK, uh, and have different claims to citizenship, different claims to belong, different ideas about what black identity means. Um, this is a period of late 60s and 1970s, uh, I, I suggest in these two chapters, where there's a kind of global black identity that's circulating, cer certainly circulating in, in, in the Anglophone world, uh, but I think it has reaches beyond. Um, so there's a connection between an anti-apartheid movement, obviously student movements in, in South, South Africa, um, black power, civil rights assertions uh, in the US and, and in the the UK, and so I'm trying to work through what that means and what that looks like in these two places. And then finally, I end with a chapter on music, and there's music actually throughout. Um, there's music in the early chapters. There's certainly music as a, a critical part of the carnival chapters. Uh, but I end with a final chapter that really sort of thinks about uh, identity through music. So it has a sort of parallel, I think, to the Mark Matera "Sounds of Black London" um, chapter that I sent. Although I, I look, I'm looking at a later period. I'm looking at the '60s and '70s primarily. Okay, that's a a lot about about the book, which isn't even out yet, but to give you a sense of sort of how the project came to be, why I think it's important, what it's trying to do. Um, the book will be out next, next spring, uh, one hopes. Um, let us talk a little bit about performance. So obviously performance is really critical in, in my thinking about carnival, my writing about and thinking about West Indian carnival both in the US and in, in, the, in the UK, but I have again this kind of broader interest just in, in music more generally, music that, that sort of uh, um, extends beyond these formal performance spaces or these, or these kind of discrete performance spaces of the carnival um, but are more a part of kind of everyday life. Um, how do we, you know, and this I think speaks to uh, some of the questions of identity that I'm trying to grapple with in this book more broadly, right? You know, if we think about uh, black southerners who migrate um, to, to the north and the midwest, um, how many of you have read Isabel Wilkerson's The Warmth of Other Sons? All right, a few, you know, good. Um, you know, this is kind of magisterial epic story that she's trying to tell. The focus is really primarily on, on of course, the, the African-American story, but she, but she frames it very um, compellingly um, looking at these different periods. She's, for those of you who aren't familiar with the book, um, uh, Isabel Wilkerson is, is a journalist who, um, who interviewed about 1,000, I think it's 1,100 people for this book, um, but she focuses really on three characters uh, who, who sort of stand in for these kind of wider, uh, wider developments. Uh, one who migrates uh, from the south to the west coast, one who migrates in the very kind of traditional sense of from Mississippi to Chicago, and a third who migrates um, from Florida to, to New York City in three different decades, and she follows them and sort of their family's histories. Um, at what point, if you're thinking about these black southerners who leave the south and, and, and settle in New York or, or, or Milwaukee or wherever, do they become New Yorkers? 
or do they always remain Southerners? Right? Is their culture always Southern? Right? If, you, if, if someone leaves Mississippi in 1935 and spends the rest of their life into their 80s in Chicago, are they, in, you know, let's say they left as a young adult, uh, are they still a Mississippian? Right? And that might seem just kind of a, 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 maybe an esoteric question, but I think it actually has some, some import, import um, to sort of think about how people, how people um, conceive of themselves, conceive of their identity, and, and again, these kinds of solidarities, solidarities that, that are taking place. Well, in terms of their culture, right, the culture that gets made, the people who have moved, right, if a, if, if, if a, if a Caribbean artist comes to the U.S. and records a calypso that's about life in the U.S., you know, it's a Caribbean musical form, it's a Trinidadian musical form, but it's also saying something about migration, it's saying something about a diasporic identity and a certain kind of displacement from home. Um, so, thinking about sound, right, I mean, can sounds actually travel, you know, in, in, in a kind of formal sense? Um, let us pause, if we could. Um, questions about anything I said or questions about the chapter that you read uh, of mine and then we'll get into some of the other readings as well. We got one here and then I wonder if you could talk a little bit more about and I'm paraphrasing you said when is blackness more important than I guess nationalism, like being a Trinidadian. Mm -hmm. Can you talk a little bit more about that? Were you were you referring? It, I was wondering if you were referring to um, those times when there is, as an example, violence against black people. Yeah. That black people, no matter where you come from, you come together, as opposed to other times when there is pride about where you come from mm -hmm. and that makes you different from the person who's sitting next to you who might be the same skin color but has a different background. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, you basically summed, summed up, you know, what, what it is that I'm trying to get at. Um, so certainly those kind of moments of external threat are times that I, that I, that I think, um, you know, by and large we see uh, um, so blackness come to the fore as, as, as a kind of uh, the most salient identity and those other things become a little bit more secondary. Um, now, I don't think that's totalizing. And I think there, there are always going to be fissures. Uh, and and you know, there are, there are going to be fissures around class, right, and respectability politics and things like that. There are going to be uh, certainly fissures around gender, right? So if, if black women are the objects of violence, does the community sort of rally in the same way um, as when, when black men are, are the objects of violence, for example? Um, maybe another moment that we might think about is, is around electoral politics. And this is really important, of course, for New York. Um, I, I should have said in the beginning that part of what, part of some, part of the things that I'm saying, some of the things that I'm saying, I think are, will be setting you up for the conversation you'll have with Professor Brian Purnell, talking about the civil rights movement in New York and in Brooklyn, and also Professor Christina Greer, who's written this brilliant book, Black Ethnics, about a lot of this stuff, more in the contemporary period. Um, so, uh, particularly I think Professor Greer will, will talk a little bit about electoral politics, but sort of thinking about um, you know, black Brooklyn as being both African American Brooklyn and Caribbean Brooklyn and when do poli when can black politicians draw upon which constituencies right mobilize um, I, I talk a little bit in my book about Shirley Chisholm who was really you know pioneering uh, a, a black politician who you know is of is of Barbadian descent but essentially grows up in in Brooklyn um, is you know strongly identifies with her West Indian heritage. You know speaks with an accent, uh, a, a slight accent, um, but but does a pretty um, a pretty good job I think of mobilizing African American voters. You know as part of her electoral coalition. Um, I think later on uh, some of the some of the um, politicians who succeed her try to contest around um, Central Brooklyn have a harder time of, of of kind of marrying those coalitions, African American and West Indian coalition. So that I think there are times also when when um, the simple, we need a black person in Congress, is, that's not enough. That's, that, that, and then people have uh, these attachments to other kinds of identities. Um, 
I'm curious about the post-colonial condition mm -hmm. as it relates to the Black Atlantic, mm -hmm. um, particularly as it relates to um, for Afro-Caribbeans that are in the American context, mm -hmm. because depending on where they settle and when they settle will, I think, ultimately affect whether or not they identify themselves as black. Um, even in the contemporary context, mm -hmm. you know, um, if you are a, an Afro-Caribbean descendant migrating to Jim Crow South, you don't really get to choose whether you're going to identify with being right. Jamaican or not, because right. there's still only one sign on the door. Yeah. But there's more flexibility to some degree in the North. Mm -hmm. And then in terms of how they identify or understand what it means to be black. So, for example, my my Caribbean colleague who is extremely dark will tell you she's not black and and would tell her teachers when she was a student in New York, don't talk to me that way, you can talk to black people that way, but don't talk to me that way, I'm Caribbean, mm -hmm. as a sign of distinguishing herself, which I saw as a post-colonial issue mm -hmm. that didn't get unpacked too well. I don't know if, if that makes any sense. Yeah, yeah. Uh, it, do, it does make sense. It's, it's a huge issue, obviously. It's a huge question. Um, <coughs> let me see how I can try to tackle it. Um, you know, as a historian, of course, I'm a big proponent advocate um, for historical specificity, right? To so be very clear about, you know, the, as you said, so the moment when somebody say migrates, or so the moment we're talking about, we're talking about nineteen, you know, pre nineteen twenty four. We're talking about pre nineteen sixty five. After nineteen sixty five, we're talking about the eighties. I mean, those are really different historical moments, and how uh, an Afro Caribbean immigrant uh, or migrant might identify has a lot to do with, with those things. I mean, the, the kind of legal architecture, both in the US and the UK, UK um, certainly has uh, something to do, a not small amount to do um, with, are we talking about pre-independence or post-independence, right? I mean, it, you know, and so, you know, many Caribbean migrants to both the US and the UK, and particularly to the UK, uh, migrated with the intention of, uh, as a temporary stay, right? We're, I'm going to go for a few years, I'm going to go for five years, I'm going to save money, send it back home, and then I will return. And five years becomes 10, 10 becomes 20, you have kids, and you know, it's, it's not as easy to save as you know, one might have thought, or one was led to believe, and, and so on and so forth. Um, but that period of that five to 10 to 20 to even 25 years, you know, some, some people I interviewed, and many oral histories that you read, it takes a long time for people to sort of get that, to, to reach that realization that they're actually not, re you know, very likely to return. Or if they're going to return, it's only in retirement, you know, that they're in their very kind of later years. But that identification as I'm only here temporarily, I think, part of what I find is it obviates a little bit some of the, um, or undercuts some of the uh, kind of potential political mobilization that might happen in that place. Um, so that, that, was, that was a little roundabout way of saying that. Uh, some of the Caribbean migrant population, particularly in London, I think was less apt to mobilize in London for around issues of race, racial justice um, because they had a kind of, um, like sort of keeping the UK at a, at a bit of an arm's distance, right? They sort of say, I'm just, I'm not I'm only here for a little bit, I'm, I don't want to really get involved in all that, you know, I'm just trying to do my thing and, and, and that. Um, you know, once you get to the point of dual citizenship, right, and post-independence, that's another, that's a different factor and a different way of thinking about it. Uh, but in terms of just sort of color consciousness within black communities and certainly within the Caribbean, as we see in the, in, in, in the Dominican Republic right now, I mean, that is, is a huge, huge, huge issue. Um, I touch a little bit on the book, in the book on it, but not, not too deeply. That's a great question. Um. Oh, God, I'm sorry. Yeah. <laughs> we're here, then we're here, then we're back, and then we keep going. Okay, so my question is actually the opposite of okay. that. Do you have any or know whether there's any sort of research or scholarship around um, how white people or like the sh dominant power structure would po impose um, black identity on black people in sort of a divisive way? I'm thinking about that from the perspective of in academia or especially in contemporary times, there are not a lot of black Americans in elite institutions, and so you have a lot of Afro-Caribbeans, um, 
people from continental Africa who are like the black student population and how that operates in those environments or um, how that operates in a sort of city environment when you have um, in a contemporary perspective like you have gentrification and you have people who have like been there for generations on top of people who are the white black aspect right. of that like is there any sort of um, research or scholarship existing on how white operation onto black identity uh, works in that division yeah um, that's a, that, that would actually be a great question for Professor Greer when she comes um, she, she's a political scientist um, written this, as I said, this book, Black Ethnics. Um, so, I th so I think she could talk a little bit more about that research. I mean, one of the books that comes to mind is, is a book by a sociologist named Mary Waters. Um, title is off the tip of my tongue. It'll come back to me in, in, in a few, what's that? Black. Black Identities, yeah, thank you. Um, which focuses, not, it does not look a great deal uh, really at all at Africans, continental Africans, but does focus on Caribbean identity and first and second generation, right? There's also that generation issue, it's really important. Again, someone who migrates, who was born in the Caribbean and migrates here, has a different kind of ethnic and racial um, um, formation than somebody who was born here. So it's a little bit of def deflection because I don't actually have a great answer for you. I was really. Just okay. Do you have more oh. slides and presentations? I got I got slides for days, bro. I can hold it. Okay. Maybe one more question. That we can All right, and we'll keep it, we'll keep it moving. Yeah. All right. Okay. So <laughs> I was struck by um, just the idea of the Caribbean and West Africans and in the bands, but is there any of that same history here in New York where there was that intertwine of? I don't know. Like, is there, you know, is there a scholarship on that, or is it just that? It, on, on, on West Africans in, I mean, in, there is, but but. But is that, it because they were, you know? It's British a much colonies. later migration. Okay. It's a much later migration. I mean, there, are, there there's a smattering of, of West Africans or other Africans in the, in the in the U.S. in this sort of time period of 30s and 40s, but it's, it's really small, particularly compared to to, to England. Um, the kind of bulk of the Caribbean, excuse me, the African migration is from the 80s to the present time. Um, there's a, there's a nice book that is sort of called a synthetic story of, of, of black migration that some of you might be interested in. Um, another title is escaping me, but it's by Ira Berlin, uh, the great historian of slavery. Um, the making of making of black the four great, it's the, I think that's the subtitle, right? It's the making of black America, the four great migrations or something to that effect. Um, you're at College Park. Yeah, yeah. Um, but anyway, what, what Berlin does in that book, which is from a few years ago, is to suggest that in, in the kind of creation of, of what we think of as black America, there are four phases, right? There are four historical phases, four, four rather than the great migration, there's actually four great migrations that we need to think about in terms of the, the creation of black identity in, in, in continental North America. Uh, the first, of course, is the Middle Passage, the transatlantic slave trade. The second is the domestic, internal slave trade, right, of the, of the early to mid-19th century. Uh, the third, then, is, is the great, what we call the Great Migration, the black southerners moving to the south, and the, from the south to the north, uh, north, midwest, and, and west coast. And then the final migration is what he thinks of as the kind of contemporary uh, migration, immigration, of Caribbean and African immigrants, uh, again, from, from the 80s to the present. So he sort of situates these four modes as, as ways of thinking about migration kind of synthetically throughout uh, 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 American history. The making of African America. Thank you so much. Um, all right, let's, let's keep going a little bit in terms of performance, um, and we can you know, cycle back to some of these uh, other questions. So... Again, thinking about you know sounds and music, um, calypso. You know, I entered this project knowing next to nothing about calypso. Um, you know, for those of you of a certain generation um, or a certain family background, you may be you know fairly well versed in calypso. And those of you from other backgrounds, other you know, not at all. Um, of course, for for many Americans who are more broadly, Harry Belafonte's you know, uh, million selling, it was the first million selling LP, um, you know, the Banana Boat song, Deo, right, it's it kind of set off, which didn't set off, actually sort of was part of a very short-lived but incredibly uh, expansive Calypso craze, Calypso fad, 
of the of the of the late 1950s. Um, and for most people, that's more or less all they know about calypso. It's this sort of vaguely Caribbean, not really sure where it's from, uh, musical form, and you know, straw hats, and you know, kind of happy-go-lucky, um, you know, uh, West Indians. Obviously, it's it's a rich, much richer history, um, and so. Uh, as I as I got into this project, um, I, I sort of had to had to learn a little bit about calypso. Uh, I'm by no means an expert, but um, as you see, this 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 that particular musical form, along with other musical forms, are traveling with these migrants, and they're 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 traveling with, but they're also narrating the migrations themselves, right? And so I I, um, I think this slide. Let me get a different slide here. <coughs> Right, so that of course is the Empire Windrush, this this iconic ship. This is as it's docking in England, you know, the newsreel cameras are and you know Funnily enough, Lord Kitchener has a, a calypso already composed, ready to share with the world about London, right? But I, I play this, you know, just because it's great footage, but also because it shows the ways that um, that calypso is sort of just embedded in this narrative of migration from the very beginning, um, and that that Lord Kitchener is part of this kind of small coterie, um, small small kind of cohort of of these performers um, who had already experienced travel around the Caribbean. Most of them are Trinidadian, and they and they, they start in Trinidad and they, they travel in this kind of circuit around uh, the Caribbean. They travel to Jamaica. They travel all around Cuba. Um, some of them have traveled already to the U.S., uh, but most of them sort of stay within the kind of circum-Caribbean uh, and then come across in the late 40s and into the early 50s uh, and not only perform these, uh, these calypsos, but start to record them. Um, and, and, it's the, and it's the recording of these um, that, is, that in some way sort of documents or, or is seen as a document of, of these migrations and of, the, of these communities. There's, the, of course, this parallel story that's happening in New York. Um, Lord Invader um, and, and others who, who are performing that's in the in the Donald Hill um, article or essay that you that you looked at this this so what Hill says you know that you know we know about Harry Belafonte in the 50s but um, that that whole phenomenon um, completely obscures you know two decades plus of performance uh, in New York you know, particularly in Harlem, but, but really kind of all over the city, um, and not only performance, but also recording of calypsos. Um, calypsos that are really topical, that's the nature of the genre, um, that speak to the conditions of migration, that speak to global politics, um, they speak to um, decolonization or the push for decolonization, they speak, uh, Lord Invader has a very popular calypso, a very important calypso rather, uh, about um, it's called Crisis in Arkansas, Crisis in Arkansas um, which is all about the Little Rock uh, 
um, you know, school desegregation crisis of 1957. Um, there, there are numbers, there are calypsos about um, uh, Ghanaian independence. There are calypsos about you know, huge hurricane that hits Jamaica in the 50s. There are calypsos about the coronation of the queen. I mean, there are all these kind of topical, um, uh, and many of them political kinds of songs, but there are also songs that are about, you know, dealing with your landlord, riding the subway, um, and in some of the links that I sent you, about carnival, right? About, about what becomes the West Indian Day Parade and Notting Hill Carnival, there are calypsos written about, on the one hand, uh, Lord Invader has um, Labor Day, which is a, his excitement about, you know, you know, jumping up on Eastern Parkway or jumping up in, on, on uh, in, in, the, in the New York Carnival, um, and compare that to I think it's the Mighty Terror, no carnival in Britain. You know, this is which is I think written or, or, or recorded in 1955 or so. Is, is lamenting the fact that you know I've migrated to this this cold, miserable, rainy place where the food is terrible, and not only that, there's no carnival. Right? What am I doing here? Right? So I think. Uh, those kinds of performances are, are really important to look at on their own, but also in conjunction with this kind of broader social, this broader social history. Um, you you will have noticed um, that uh, so much of this history of performance of carnival performance, excuse me, calypso performance is male dominated. Right, almost all of the major performers in this period are are men. Um, there is. There are a few women. Uh, one of them uh, is this woman, Mona Batiste, uh, who is a Trinidadian. Um, she's actually really not a professional musician before she arrives in, in, in England. She comes from Trinidad. Um, I don't think she actually played the saxophone. I think this is just, she's just posing here with this, with this instrument. Um, uh, but but she does uh, she works like as a clerk or something. But she kind of has these dreams of performance, and she um, starts she puts together a band or joins with a band and, and cuts a few 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 records, including uh, this calypso that I'll play for you in a little bit called Calypso Blues. Um, she eventually becomes a, a fairly big star, not in England but in Germany. Um, she le she leaves England and goes to Germany, and I think spends the, if not all of the rest of her life, most of the rest of her life performing and I think acting as well in Germany. But but as you see. Um, uh, you know, again, a lot of the most of the calypso performers, the major ones, the, the ones that got recorded, were, were men. And so that's something to think about in terms of um, as we consider performance and expressive culture, the kind of gender dimensions of, of all of that. Um, let's see what else we have here. So on the question of um, of gender, right? So, I, so this was something that I that I certainly noticed in my research. Again, you know, this, the kind of predominance of these male performers. Um, but I did in researching the history of of the rise of Caribbean carnival here in New York. Carnival here starts, as I said, in the late '40s. It starts in Harlem. It's, uh, it's here in Harlem for about um, roughly 15 years, um, and for for a variety of reasons, uh, the city takes away the permit. So it starts, you know, very small, um, grows, grows, grows. It's, you know, a few hundred thousand people come out. It's on Labor Day, which is sort of the traditional end of summer here in New York. It's not the traditional time of, of the pre-Lenten Carnival, which of course is, you know, in the winter time, February, March. Um, but it's sort of more suitable to the weather and the conditions here. So it's it's, it's Labor Day. Um, so the Carnival starts in in the 40s and goes through the 50s. By the early 60s, um, it's starting. To, the organization of it is starting to kind of fall apart. Um, so it's the city. There's a small incident of like a bottle throwing or something, and the city revokes the permit. Um, kind of goes into this period of dormancy and then is reconstituted in the late 60s in Brooklyn. And it's very convenient for my story because I'm suggesting that there's this transformation in, in the geography of black New York, and in particular Caribbean New York. And it's decentered from Harlem, now the center is, is, is central Brooklyn. And, and it's sort of reconstituted there in the late 1960s and grows there exponentially from that period forward. Um, down Eastern Parkway, that kind of border between Bedford-Stuyvesant and Crown Heights. Um, but in, so in researching some of this history, I came across the name Daphne Weeks. And Daphne Weeks uh, was a piano player and a composer, um, born in Trinidad. Uh, she had had a performing career there and, and came here in the 1940s. And she performed from, from very early on. She had her own band um, or orchestra. 
Um, she was based in Brooklyn, and as far as I can tell, you know, mainly stayed in New York. I don't think she traveled a great deal, uh, although I'm not sure, um, but was part of a number of these kind of carnival performances and was a, was a key organizer um, in the later 60s of carnival in Brooklyn, the West Indian Day Parade in Brooklyn. But this flyers from, uh, I think, the early 60s. Um, there's a small collection of her papers for those who are interested at, at the Schomburg. Um, it's just called the Daphne Weeks Collection. Um, there's an oral history with her, an interview with her um, that talks a lot about her, um, her involvement in Carnival and some of her performances. I have not yet found any recordings that she did. I don't know if she recorded at all. Um, I would love to find it. Um, there's a little bit of personal information, but not much, and, and I'm hoping to find some of her uh, descendants, uh, her family. She didn't have any children. She was never married, um, but um, she was a really important performer, and there are many of the sort of elders of the, of the West Indian community involved in Carnival. You know, have you know really great recollections of her. In any case, um, this flyer I like. Right, the Battle of Music, American and American and Calypso. Right, again, this kind of juxtaposition between you know whatever American music is in this in this context. Is, is this jazz? Is this is this you know kind of R and B? Is this something else? Not really sure. Labor Day, Renaissance Ballroom is is, is here in Harlem. Sorry, because in the previous image, is, I take it that's fast screen on the left there. Yes. Is, and I, I'm not familiar with this. Is that a clarinet he's holding? Or? It is a clarinet, and um, he'll appear in, in, in a couple slides later. So when, I, when I first saw this, I figured, I figured he was African American. That's, that's the setup, right? Is that you know, right. he would be African American, fat screen, sounds like a great African American you know, jazz name, uh, Daphne Weeks, a kind of side by side kind of thing. It's not quite. Not quite as neat, but um, something to that effect. Here's, here's one of those, um, those other big carnival performances. Um, here's Lord Invader, Daphne Weeks. I think that's her right there. And then Claude Fats Green's Calypso Orchestra. <laughs> so I don't know. So is he African American performing Calypso, or is he, you know, West Indian performing, you know, popular African American or American tunes? Who, you know, I don't know. I've I, I not, I've not done any research. Maybe it's some you know, one of you all want to look into uh, Claude Fats Green. Um, but again, um, Carnival of Carnivals pre Valentine dance. So this this is interesting. So compare just the just the time period. As I said, you know, Carnival in New York, the, part of the adaptation of, of bringing Carnival to New York City was, is the change in the calendar, right? So whereas Trinidad Carnival, like, like Rio, like, like uh, um, Mardi Gras, you know, happens in, in that kind of February, uh, early March period, you know, before Lent. Um, and so here's, the, here's that Labor Day parade, or you know, Labor Day um, event, Carnival event. Here we have Carnival of Carnival, pre-Valentine, so now we're back in February, so it's kind of an acknowledgement also of what's happening at home. We're here in New, we're here in New York, but you know, we know back home people are celebrating, um, celebrating Carnival. And of course, you know, many of these performers, again, I'm not sure about Daphne Reeks, but, but many of these other performers you know, traveled back and forth and continue to do so in terms of contemporary Carnival performance. People travel on this circuit. Um, you know, there's, there's a major Carnival in, in, in Toronto, Carabana, um, Trinidad Carnival, the New York Carnival, London, and Kind of smaller ones elsewhere, um, and many of these kind of big performers will just travel for several months, you know, just going to all these major carnivals and being sponsored and, and, and performing um, in dances and so forth. Um, and then this this last one I thought was interesting um, to sort of think about, you know, the, sort of the, that, the, the question of Africa, right? Um, Ola Tunji is a very well known um, Nigerian drummer, uh, and then and then. Um, Randy Weston, uh, in his uh, 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 memoir, um, but also this great book by the historian Robin Kelly, um, which is kind of the expansion of that short article that I sent you. It's called uh, Africa Speaks, America Answers, and it's about the kind of relationship between jazz in the U.S. and jazz on the continent. Uh, and he, he sort of profiles four, four different performers, one of whom is Randy Weston. And so, but in that book, Olatunji appears um, fairly prominently as someone who is uh, trying to, and successfully bringing African rhythms you know, into American performance spaces. Um, and so here, uh, here we have both uh, Daphne Weeks and, and, and Ola Tunji performing uh, side by side. Again, this is, I think, early 60s, 62 or something like that.
you know, part of doing this this book, this this work, is has been creating my own archive, right? I mean, that's that's the nature of any any kind of research project. But I think, in particular, the kinds of connections that I'm trying to draw, um, you know. So, in terms of like the archives that I've visited, I've probably been to a good 15 archives or so um, in in the UK here and also in, in Trinidad. Um, I've done those oral histories that I told you about. Um, I'm gonna I'll talk more about one of the archives, which is the Brooklyn collection of the Brooklyn historic the Brooklyn uh, Public Library. I'll talk about that in in a, in a few minutes. Um, but there's, there's a lot of stuff that's just kind of in my personal collection now that I've sort of pulled from here and there. So it's a little bit hard to kind of direct you to these bigger collections. But obviously the Schomburg, which you went to this morning, is that is that right? Yeah. I mean. And the Schomburg is amazing. Can't say enough things about the Schomburg. So, um, you know, they, they have more and more things online, but I think to be to be honest, you know, most of the stuff is, is housed. You know, the, the really richest materials is housed. You know, on site. Um, but obviously, as a public library, you don't need a you don't need a, a, a university affiliation or whatever to, to access it. So as long as you can get yourself to New York, if you're not from New York, um, that that material is there. Uh, as I said, I'll talk about the the Brooklyn stuff uh, in a moment. Um, in terms of some of the other pieces that I, so the, the, the main primary source, of course, that I shared it was from Paula Marshall's uh, Triangular Road, which is her, her memoir, um, which, you know, as if you were able to read it and also read my chapter, you see I drew, you know, fairly liberally from, from it, because um, I think it's just all marvelous the way she narrates this, this family history. Um, you know, in terms of things you can do with students and things that I've done kind of Recently, I mean, I've been working on this project now for more than a decade. So one of the things that's happened over that time is, is of course, a transition in technology and the technology of research. Um, so when I started off, when I was doing the kind of uh, an initial um, research about sort of African Americans and the labor market in the 1940s, uh, my my two main sources were the NAACP papers, um, which are an incredible, incredible resource. Um, those at the time were microfilm. Now they're both microfilm but also digitized. Uh, again, I'm, I'm not sure how, uh, how widely available they are outside of university systems. Um, if they're available, for example, through Library of Congress, I'm, I, I, I'm not sure. Um, but one of the great things about the NAACP papers, of course, you have all kinds of internal memos and, and things like that, documents that are produced by uh, not only the National Office here in New York, but also uh, chapters from, from particular cities. Um, but what was so great for me was actually letters, correspondence. There are just thousands of, of letters from everyday people who write to the NAACP for help with X, Y, and Z. So in this case, when I was looking at these labor things, um, and I quote one of the letters in the chapter, uh, you know, a woman who was simply trying to get a job at the Brooklyn Navy Yard, right? And she, and she writes, and, and she you know, explains her qualifications, and she, she, she ends the letter, she says, you know, with help from God and the NAACP, I should get a job at the Navy Yard, right? This is 1944 or 45. Um, but that's a really great source for students, I and mean, if you can kind of direct them to those to that correspondence. Of course, if you don't have access to that, the, uh, um, the letters to the editor of newspapers, and particularly the the, the black press, African American press, uh, the um, the um, Amsterdam News, New York Amsterdam News, Chicago Defender, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. I don't know where our picture went. Um, those are also really great. I mean, so get get you know because part of the challenge, um, particularly doing transnational kinds of history, but any kinds of uh, social history, right? It's kind of moving away from elites, right? It's sort of getting the perspective of of everyday people. It's really challenging. So one of the ways you do that is through oral history and and or, and, and, and so forth. Um, sometimes it's through memoirs, but you know most memoirs are written by people we would sort of think of in so, in some form or fashion as being elite. Um, so another way is through <laughs> through these kinds of letters, and of course that. I mean, that, that's another kind of barrier, the barrier of literacy. I mean, who's actually going to sit down and write a letter and have it pu get it published? But you know, nevertheless, I mean, that's at least a, a little bit of window. In the writing I'm doing, the writing I did on, on Carnival, uh, a, a lot of that chapter actually um, draws from letters to the, to the Amsterdam News in particular um, to try to gauge community perceptions, you know, the Harlem community's perceptions of this West Indian event. And so there are letters by people who are, I either infer uh, to be or who self-identify as African American. They're, so they're, they're commenting on what they perceive to be this, this West Indian display of performance and culture. And you know, some are very supportive and say, you know, it's too bad you know, us Negroes, American Negroes, don't have something like this. 
and then others are like, this is the most garish, sexualized, you know, uh, scandalous thing we've ever seen. We must eliminate this from the street, our streets as soon as possible, and this is that kind of range. Um, so those, so those, uh, those are great sources. Um, and, and then the memoirs. Um, I won't say too much about the secondary sources. I mean, I'll just, I can show you a couple of them. This Black London book just, just came out. It just came out like a couple months ago. Um, and it's really, there was, um, in terms of black British history, for those who are interested in black British studies, um, I think we're right now at a, at a kind of a moment, a cusp, and there's kind of going to be an explosion of new work. There's been like, 20 years or so, and there's been very little written, uh, certainly scholarly stuff that's been written about black, blacks in Britain. Um, there was you know, an amazing flowering of both scholarship and artistic work in the 1980s, um, led by the late sociologist Stuart Hall um, and many of his students, including one of my advisors, Paul Gilroy. Um, but that work is really, you know, most of it was published in the, in the late 80s into the 90s. And then since then, there hasn't been much, and there's certainly not been much historically, historically oriented. Um, but people sort of in my generation of, 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 of the academy are, are now just publishing our books. And Mark Matera is one of the first. And so this is a really phenomenal, very detailed, very thick, not like light reading, but, um, but, but it's a really incredible resource. Um, Again, this is uh, Irma Watkins Owens, you know, this kind of really pioneering book from uh, 1996, um, a historian of, of uh, Caribbean Americans. While, while I'm doing show and tell, let me just keep going. Um, I've, I've sent you the link to this, the, the Smithsonian collection of Lord Invader. Um, you can just listen to snippets and then you can purchase the whole thing if you want. It's available, I think, also on Amazon. Um, some libraries, at least research libraries, will have a, there's a di like a digital version of this, so you can just sort of stream it. But for, for most of us regular folks, you actually have to, have to buy the, the, the MP3s or the CD. Um, but it has a great, um, a very, very detailed um, set of liner notes. So anyone who's interested in performance in New York around Calypso, um, that sort of ex um, extends some of what is in the Donald Hill essay, I recommend that highly. Um, and then, lastly, um, is this collection, London is the Place for Me, um, Trinidad and Calypso in London, 1950 to 56. This came out about a decade, a little more than a decade ago, and includes uh, Lord Kitchener, um, the Mighty Terror Carnival song, so several others. This was a massive, massive hit. I mean, it's insofar as something like this is a kind of obscure anthology of 1950s Calypso, it's going to be a map. But it was really, very popular for this small independent label in West London called Honest John's. And it spawned, I think, seven or eight subsequent volumes. Um, this is the second one. Um, they branched out after the first couple that, that were almost exclusively focused on these calypsos, Trinidadian music, into West African music and a lot of the kind of music that, that Mark Matera talks about in that book. Um, so for those who are interested, um, look for Honest John's records in London. I think, well, any questions about you? Um, All right, we gotta get, gotta get the mic for posterity. Speak up so everyone can hear you in the um, back. There were a couple of key points that I wanted to raise when you were mentioning the gap in um, the scholarship. Yep. So when you were mentioning the gap in the scholarship, um, I think that you've been following the, the recent issues with um, students at Cambridge and Oxford mm -hmm. that were pushing for black studies and the significant yeah. resistance that they got um, as to whether that's part of the reason for the gap, because I think the majority of the Black Atlantic research and scholarship is coming from this side of the Atlantic, but if they don't have institutions to cultivate their own research, mm -hmm. then, you know, so I, I don't even know that it's completely resolved at Oxford. No, definitely not. Yeah, and, and so that's I think. Would you yeah, so so part of the so part of the issue for those who aren't familiar is is you know what's kind of two pronged. I mean, one is sort of a lack of kind of institutional. Um, uh, kind of support or kind of inst institutional embodiment of black British studies, right? There, are, there really is no Schomburg 
for this. There's very recently um, the Black Cultural Archives, uh, in, in which is located in Brixton, which used to be a small kind of storefront operation, and they, they ran both a small kind of community museum and then also a, an archive. Um, did this huge fundraising thing, and they just opened a, a, a kind of brand new, um, you know, kind of proper museum. But it's really the, almost the only one in the entire country. Excuse me, but there's there's no Black British Studies department in any any British university, um, so that's one issue. Related but separate issue is the is, is the lack of, um, of of Black British academics in the British Academy, right? Very, I mean, just minuscule number. I mean, you think it's bad here in some of our institutions where, where you all um, are, are affiliated. I mean, it is nothing compared to, to what it is, uh, and particularly in the, in the kind of flagship schools like Oxford and Cambridge, but, but many of the other universities as well. Many reasons for that, which we don't have time to get into, but part of the phenomenon that I think you're getting at is also that you know, many of the most influential black uh, British academics left Britain in the 80s uh, and came here and, and kind of established their careers here. Um, a few returned, uh, or some go back and forth, but, but, but it sort of shifted the focus and, and th therefore they, they were training students to produce the kind of work um, of which I'm trying to contribute, to which I'm trying to contribute um, from this side rather from that side. So it's a, it's a whole yeah. issue. Yeah. And so I think the film um, Bell, mm. is that helpful? So the film Bell, mm -hmm. you know, about Dido Bell Lindsay, I think that's coming out of the other side of the Atlantic, yeah. you know, as a way to start investigating who, what, when, where, um, because aside from that film, there hasn't been on this side as much attention given to her other than the painting, yeah. right? And so the idea of, well, who, who were the blacks in that particular context at that particular time, because uh, you had American like you had Americans like Ekmiano who then settled over in London uh, so that he was actually more, I think, more European than he was American. But then hearing from them about their own narratives, that's what I think is still probably being discovered at this point. Yeah, so a lot of, I mean, just, to, just to wrap this up quickly, I mean, a lot of the black British history to date has been fairly localized. I mean, there's lots of efforts in various neighborhoods, including West London, including Notting Hill, where I've done my work. Um, these kind of local archives, community archives, um, community organizations that are trying to document their elders and that kind of stuff. Um, but in terms of really coordinated at a national level or, or kind of institutional level, affiliated with major universities, it, that's, that's been you know, really lacking, I think, over the last you know, 20 years or so. So, anything else just on sources or things of that nature? I have a question not about uh, your record. I will repeat the question for the historical yeah. record. Uh, this is for the historical record. Yeah, yeah it's important. Uh, well, right. So, you mentioned at the top of your lecture performance studies, and I was hoping that you could talk a bit about that literature and what it has to say about. Are your theorizations and some of the others inside of diaspora okay. and how that works out? Um, so the question if for, is about performance studies and how that figures into um, studies of black internationalism or diaspora more broadly. Um, I don't, I, so I should say I don't identify as a performance studies scholar. Um, I, I, I re, you know, my training is as a historian, of course, um, but I have a joint degree in history and African American studies. And so for me, interdisciplinary, interdisciplinarity has always been part of uh, how I approach my work and how I approach the questions that I'm asking. So I try to read you know, across disciplines. I read sociology around, you know, for example, these issues of um uh, of immigration or assimilation or what have you. And I, I do read a little bit in performance studies. Um, you know, for me, the best work in performance studies is the really hi deeply historical work. I mean, that's, or, or I should say that's the work that I gravitate towards. Um, you know, because for me to, ice, you know, I, I am often left dissatisfied um, with work that isolates a performance. Right, that's, that 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 sort of analyzes it um, in, in in great detail, but takes it out of a social context, takes it out of a political context, takes it out of um, kind of other sorts of contexts. So I want stuff that's really deeply grounded. Um, let me think of an example. Um, the book that comes to mind, or scholar that comes to mind, is my former colleague at Princeton, Daphne Brooks, um, now at Yale, uh, um, professor of English and performance studies, drama, theater. Um, her first book is about um, 
it's called um, Bodies in Descent. Bodies in Descent, and it's about um, performances of, of, of kind of fugitivity and freedom in the 19th and early 20th centuries in, in sort of transatlantic world. Um, I could think of some more. Uh, maybe since or send, or I could add to the add to my wiki. Yeah. All right. Well, and I'm also big just, and I'm, you know, I, you know our colleague Frank uh, Beridi. Yes. Doing a bit of work like this as well. It's, it's a way in which the historian's profession, sorry, I guess, so there's a way in which the historian's profession, we've relied so much on, you know, the archive, meaning the textual. Yeah. And what, and I'm not a, I'm by no means a performance studies uh, scholar, but I've, you know, talked with many of them. Well, I've talked with some of them. I shouldn't act like I even have so many that I know. But there's a way in which politics is transmitted through performance yeah. in ways that we've completely ignored for so long, right? We, when we look for politics of, you know, when Lord Kitchener gets off the boat and he's, or he's still on the ship, and he's interviewed and says, I, you know, London is the place for me, but then some 15 or more years later, you have other, you know, Calypso performers also, you know, complaining about, right this new home, there's politics in that that mm -hmm. may not make it to an archive, so to speak. Yeah. And I think there's so many ways that we could explore that in our teaching, in our research as well. So mm -hmm. that's where the question came yeah, from. Yeah, I mean, that, and that has been part of the the work and the battles I think I've had to fight over over my work um, is, to, is to get accepted, you know, in those places because you know I move away or, or alongside the textual archive, alongside the government reports, alongside the the kind of things that we think of as traditional sources. I'm also, you know, I also have reggae songs. I also have films. I'm also um, exploring literature. I'm trying to, you know, I'm trying to suggest that this is all. For me, I mean, I'm, I'm not into capital H history. That's what I call it, capital H history. You know, this is what is historical. This is what counts as a source, right? And I think, you know, black it, it, and that tradition is black studies. Black studies, you know, has has no time for capital H history. You know, we, we just well, and, and understandably so because black history has been left out of so many exactly. archives anyway. Exactly. That pro, we were talking about this a day or two ago. Perforce, you know, necessarily black studies has to be interdisciplinary. Right. Has to be creative in its historical document or right. its, its historical sources. Yeah. Um, so I just want to say this is you know, fascinating stuff, and we look forward to more of it. Let's. Oh, okay. You had your hand up for a long time. Let's get the mic. I was just wondering um, of which waves were your uh, interviewees from, the first wave or the second wave, like pretty mainly? No, which, which waves? Um, I mean, mo I would say the majority of the people that I interviewed would be considered elders, right? And first so wave. there were folks who, um, by the time I interviewed them, were in their, somewhere from their, from their 60s through their 90s. Mm -hmm. um, so they would have been you know, more or less of the kind of earlier generation, the kind of first wave. And I've interviewed fewer, a couple exceptions, you know, kind of younger people of the, of the kind of second generation. Okay, kind of a follow-up. I was just wondering, what was their, um, I guess, economic status in their homeland before they came to America? Mm -hmm. I'm just thinking off of what you said, that um, it was a temporary stay for the, you know, the people that you spoke to, and my family came in the second wave, and a lot of people I know from the second wave, this was like utopia, you know, <laughs> com yep. you know, compared to their homeland. So I was yeah. just wondering which way. Uh, it would okay. be hard to generalize, you know, given the kind of diversity of the people that I talked to. Um, you know, there are people who were, you know, solidly middle class, who um, were reluctant. I'm, I'm thinking about, um, um, well, anyways, I'm thinking about a particular person who, who, who was came from a kind of brown skin middle class family in Jamaica um, had a pretty good life got a good you know colonial education had a good job she was trained as a nurse um, had a partner or husband who had migrated to uh, London uh, and she stayed back and she said, I, I, you know why would I go there you know this post-war London's been bombed out why would I why would I leave here for that but you know eventually she did go um, but di didn't wasn't arriving there in the mid-1950s seeing this as you know I finally made it to the mother country or somehow I've, I've, I've reached this kind of utopia I mean it was kind of a, a reluctant uh, move whereas you know other people um, there's a woman named Edith Taylor who I interviewed uh, who was from Orangeburg South Carolina who you know, graduates high school in the 1940s in Orangeburg, South Carolina, as Jim Crow, and um, you know there are very few options, right? There's domestic work, and there's domestic work, and there's domestic work, and you know, 
Uh, and so an opportunity to come to, to come to New York really meant something, and it's sort of really different. Um, but it'd be hard to kind of generalize broadly, but I think you're absolutely right. I mean, class, class um, position, education, those things are really important uh, variables, um, as well as like when, when people moved. Um, so I try to track that, and that's, I think, part of the, the necessity of, of being, um, of keeping a focus on individuals, you know, even as we're talking about these kind of broad, broader phenomena. All right. You have a, yeah. okay. <laughs> don't, don't apologize to me. She's the one that I run across the room with the mic. Oh, well, I was just wondering in all the uh, information you did get from Daphne Weeks, I was just, I know she was born in Trinidad or from Trinidad, yeah. but was her like family from Trinidad? Mm hmm. Oh, okay, I just wanted to. Cause was, no, we shared she herself was born in Trinidad. Mm -hmm. Family was there. Okay. As far as I know, she migrated by herself. Did not have family oh. here. She came. She came for like a year or less. Didn't like it. Went back, mm -hmm. uh, and then came back again a year or two after that, and oh, then okay. stayed from from that point forward. So I never I never got a chance to meet her. She died uh, several years ago. I mm -hmm. sort of discovered her after she had already passed. Oh, okay. Yeah. No, cause like um, we share the same last name. Oh, okay. My like my grandfather. Born in Trinidad, same last name, but his family's from Barbados, so I was just wondering. So. Yeah, yeah. Um, I mean, and that's you know one thing about um, these kind of histories of Caribbean migration. Um, people may have uh, migrated from a particular country. Uh, or colony, right? But they may necessarily have roots, you know, there. That you know, there's so much, you know, intra intra Caribbean migration, and sometimes difficult to to, to track. Um, this is what I was gonna. I, I, this brought me back to a point that I wanted to give you earlier, um, in terms of how the technology and things have changed my research. Um, Ancestry.com has actually been really useful in the last several years of, of tracking down these people whose whose names I only I only have their names, right? Didn't know their origins, or didn't know where they when they came to the U.S. in particular, um, and you need the kind of premium, upgraded, institutional version rather than just the, the kind of free version. But if you can get access to that um, uh, um, draft records, um, which uh, you know, people's draft cards, men's draft cards, uh, will often tell you a lot about family and, and often have a birth date on there. Um, and if they, if they, uh, so that's useful for people who are domestic migrants from the South, for example. So I found people's hometowns. I had no idea where they were from. Um, you can find out a little bit about the family, who else lives in the household. Um, that helps you kind of fill out a picture. Um, and then if people are, are coming from the Caribbean and coming to the U.S., say in the 20s or 30s, uh, you can get ship names. Um, uh, typically on the ship manifest will tell you where someone was coming from. Um, sometimes there's a kind of racial or ethnic designation, uh, which is always kind of interesting. Um, I think in that chapter I, I, I talk about um, Reverend Alcantara, right, who's, who comes from Trinidad and is designated as Spanish, but you know, you see photos of him and in all the descriptions of him later, he's talked about as a kind of Negro or black uh, Caribbean um, person. But, you know, so anyways, but I only got that through Ancestry, um, finding that, those records, which otherwise would be, you know, almost impossible to find unless you went to the National Archives and you know, dug and dug and dug and dug and dug. So that's just a great, a great source um, for your own research, but also sometimes to share with students. Let's listen to a few calypsos and we'll end by talking about um, some more sources. Let's see if we can get this to come back. Um, I'm, I'm no great technologist, uh, despite my affiliations with the Center for Digital Humanities. Um, and one of the challenges I find, and uh, you know, I, I, tell me if I'm wrong, you have a presentation at some point about, give, about giving presentations, like a workshop or something about that. Is that, is that right? Yeah, I've had a couple. Okay, so I probably should have been in that workshop. Um, but one of the challenges I find. As I move around, I, I live in New York, I teach at Princeton, I travel to archives, I give, obviously give talks to various places, um, and have all this media stuff. It's like, how do you like, give your presentation with the, you know, with the media, and, um, you know, and you know, or, like video clips and sound files and all that stuff? Um, I just got a new laptop, all my media stuff is on my old laptop, I got, disk, I got you know, external drives upon external drives, Dropbox, et cetera, et cetera. So I haven't really worked out a system that, that, that's um, completely foolproof. Still trying to figure it out. Um, I mean, one of the things that I always 
shy away from is re relying on internet connectivity, right? You never know if you actually, you know, you, you want to play a YouTube clip and suddenly there's no, you know, Wi-Fi where you are and you're stuck. So anyways, that's all a big setup to say. I started using Spotify a little bit as, as one way to kind of get around that um, because you can actually um, download, you know, kind of low quality MP3s, you know, locally to your machine. And so you don't actually have to be connected to the internet. You can just, for those who don't use Spotify, available offline and it will just sort of download the clips. So anyways, I very quickly, uh, just this morning, try to pull a few of these calypsos together. Some of them we've already, you've, I've already sent you the links, so we don't necessarily have to revisit them, but I want to play just a couple others um, to talk a little bit more about, about this uh, set of performances. So, um, you know, that's just a fun, it's a, it's a fun kind of song, but I think um, in terms of teaching or in terms of using this material, um, you know, one of the things that I would do, uh, and I would encourage you to do, of course, is to read it critically, right? So sort of think about it. This is 1955, and so we can sort of take this, um, take this um, performance, this song, and put it against, let's say, um, the Jason Sokol chapter that I gave you, Jesse Robinson's Brooklyn, right? What's happening in Brooklyn in 1955? What is the actual racial politics in Brooklyn in 1955? And what does it mean for him to say there's no place I'd rather be than Brooklyn, right? Are we to take him at his word, right? Is, there, is this tongue-in-cheek? Is this subversive? Is it both? Um, well, who's the audience? Who's he singing to? Is he singing to other Caribbean immigrants? Is he singing to uh, native-born uh, Americans? Is he singing, you know, immigration services, right? I want to stay here. Don't kick me out. Um, you know, there's a, di a lot of ways we can think about that. Um, so that's, uh, that's, I think, some of the kind of critical work that we do as scholars, but, but more importantly, I think, as teachers. I think 
So this, of course, is a kind of classic immigrants or newcomer to the city kind of tale, right? Again, we can sort of set this aside, set this al alongside uh, some of these kind of memoirs and other kinds of personal recollections. Um, this would be great to kind of just sort of teach teach this, you know, uh, to, to students about you know what it meant to come to, to the big city for the first time, you know, either as a either as a as a as a southerner, maybe from the rural uh, rural south, or or as someone from the Caribbean. It's it's humorous, it's funny, it's whatever, but it's also um, giving you some sense of that geography, right? I, He's coming from uptown, he goes to Brooklyn, spends the night, can't make his way back. How do I get back to 125th Street? Can't get a cab to take me home? I think we all know what that, you know, at least one of the implications of that. Um, so this is, I think, a way, because of the kind of topicality of Calypso, um, is really useful, uh, useful to use. Uh, let's see, what else, what else, what else? So we already heard Kitchener. Let's, oh, this is, this is also Kitchener. So fairly straightforward and, and you know, self-explanatory, um, but I think speaks to again some of the themes in the Mark and Terra uh, piece about um, you know this, these kind of interconnections between uh, West Indians and Africans, um, and, and again not to belabor this point, but the kind of topicality of Calypso, that is speaking to a, a specific um, political event and, a, and a, an event of incredible importance in the diaspora, right? The independence of the first um, uh, sub-Saharan African country in 1957. Um, this is a this is a song that's recorded. Um, by Kitchener, who's Trinidadian, in London. It's pressed up on, uh, on what would have been 78 uh, RPM record. Uh, and then that record circulates. That circulates to the US, but it circulates back to, back, it circulates to West Africa, to Ghana, to Nigeria, to other parts of the continent. Um, and so um, it's a way, again, sort of thinking about the kind of circulation of these things and the, and the connections uh, and sort of the, the identification um, across, across borders. So I mentioned Mona Baptiste as, the, as one of the kind of important um, female uh, singers in this, in this time period. So I want to play one of her songs. Mm -hmm. 
What do you hear? Longing. Yeah, lament, longing, certainly in the lyrics. What else? I can't hear you. And it had like more of a jazzy quality. Yeah. Yeah. All right, so, so in terms of the instrumentation or production, uh, less of a kind of tr traditional calypso sound, um, much more jazz oriented. So this song, as I said, is performed by Mona Baptiste in London. Um, she's Trinidadian uh, uh, background, though not uh, as far as I know, a calypso singer as such in Trinidad, but she comes and she, she performs. Uh, the band, so, so this song is, is on the London Is For Me um, compilation, the, the, uh, the first one. No, this, yeah, this one, sorry, the second. London Is The Place For Me 2. Um, the band is a, is a multi-ethnic band. It's, there's a Nigerian, there's a Jamaican, um, so, and it's recorded again in London. So thinking about these kind of traditions of jazz and, and black performance in the UK, right, really diverse, the kind of overlapping of not only calypso and jazz, but also um, you know, rhythm and blues, high life, you know, you can hear kind of elements of, of some of those things in that song. We hear, in terms of the lyrics, as somebody said, you know, lament, longing, right? Don't have enough money, take me back to Trinidad, right? So this is, the, this is recorded in the early to mid 1950s. Um, you know, a moment in which the sort of the optimism in, in, in terms of the kind of that first generation to have uh, arrived in, in London is starting to wane a little bit as they, as they kind of realize, you know, they're experiencing housing discrimination, they're experiencing um, job discrimination. As I said, as we all know, the weather is miserable, the food is terrible, um, there are still post war rations, the city's bombed out in many places. Um, and so we hear all, we, we can hear all of those kinds of things in the lyrics. However, or, or and, I don't know if it's a however, it's and. who is not from Trinidad and who is the original performer of this song. 1948, I think it was. Um, it's co-written by uh, his collaborators, uh, who's uh, an American. I'm not sure if he's black or white. Um, and it's part of a kind of this kind of tail end of that 1930s and 40s Calypso craze that we read about in the Donald Hill. Um, so Nat King Cole, you know, the great um, uh, you know, kind of jazz singer, popular pop singer of the time, jumps on this craze that Calypso, Calypso's hot. I'm gonna, you know, I got a Calypso for you, and they and they put together in, the, in this song. And you know, in terms of the instrumentation, you know, you can hear the echoes of, of you know, it's kind of more similar, let's say, to the Lord Invader than uh, than than to the Mona Baptiste that comes later. Um, but the whole story is is is. I mean, it doesn't come from personal experience at all. It doesn't come, you know, Nat King Cole's from the Midwest. He's, he's you know, an American Negro through and through. Um, and yet, there's a certain kind of resonance in this song. I mean, it, that, that, that is certainly someone who does have that experience of longing, that does have that experience of, of, of displacement. Mona Baptiste, you know, a few years later, will pick it up and record it in London, and it has a certain, you know, it has some significance there. So it's, it, I think, for me, is really interesting. And there's actually a much, there's actually a, a, a long history of this song, which I only discovered kind of as I went down the rabbit hole of YouTube. Um, there is a, awful, and I do mean awful, version by Marvin Gaye. And in a tribute album, Marvin Gaye records a tribute to Nat King Cole, an entire album of Nat King Cole songs. That sounds great. Marvin Gaye doing Nat King Cole doing Calypso. Not great. <laughs> Not great at all. Um, and there are many more contemporary versions. I, I can play one more for you later before we wrap up. But anyways, it's just a, just a, um, 
an example of, I think, how we can sort of follow performances in different ways and we can sort of unpack some of the, um, uh, the, 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 the national politics, the ethnic politics, the, the, specif the specificities of geography all within you know, one performance or one set of performances. In regard to politics, I'm curious if there had been any clear connection made between the good neighbor policy and the eventual Calypso craze, because during the good neighbor policy, the interest was really in Latin America, Carmen Miranda, I Love Lucy, mm -hmm. right? And, and the idea of the exotic kind of other mm -hmm. in that way, which then it seems to be there's this connection to then the Caribbean, Afro-Caribbean kind of exotification, yeah. so then the performativeness also has some kind of political context, or am I making a leap? No. Um, one of the, there are, I mean, obviously lots of writing on Calypso and various themed Calypso historians, but specifically on that sort of question, um, I would recommend a book by a historian named Harvey Neptune, um, who, who writes about the American occupation of Trinidad during the 1940s. Um, and so the presence of, of U.S. servicemen, um, some African American, but mainly white, um, in Trinidad and mil American military bases in Trinidad and the way that that um influences local uh, performances of Calypso, right? The Calypso's actually changed, Neptune argues, by the present, you know, they're performing for these audiences of mainly Americans in these clubs, so what they're saying actually changes, uh, but also how that um, helps to circulate um, uh, Calypso in a different way back to the U.S. or to the U.S. Uh, again, so. Um, so yes, yes, there, I mean, that does, the, 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 the context of the early Cold War, um, the, of World War II and the early Cold War has a lot to do with how Calypso is received here in the U.S. and to some extent the U.K. I just had a quick question about the migration, okay, say from Jamaica to London and then to America or mm -hmm. to New York. Is that... Um, did I miss something about that, or can you talk about that a little bit? Of, of Jamaicans specifically? Yeah. Um, yeah, so... Let me see if I can sort of distill this as, as, as quickly as possible. I mean, basically, up to... Um, up to 1924, so in the early 20th century, up to 1924, um, you know, the sort of preferred, if you want to call it that, uh, destination for um, Caribbean folks who were trying to, uh, and Jamaicans in particular, who were trying to leave um, would, would be, well, let me back up. We have this long history of intra-Caribbean migration, of course. Uh, Jamaicans in particular went to the P Panama Canal zone. Um, so lots of, that's, you know, that's happening in the early 20th century. Um, some go there temporarily and return back to Jamaica. Many also just sort of stay there and, and form communities. People going to Costa Rica, um, other parts of the Caribbean. Um, early, you know, sort of this, and this kind of picks up on the Irma Watkins Owens, right? You have the kind of first wave of, of uh, Jamaican and other uh, um, West Indian uh, migrants to the U.S. The U.S. tightens its immigration restrictions in 1924. That sort of stems the flow. It doesn't completely cut it off, but it stems the flow um, here. Um, and then that is really kind of finally really cut off in 1952, the McCarran-Walter Act. Um, so from 24... Um, up to 65, there's little to no uh, Jamaican or other Anglophone Caribbean uh, immigration to the U.S. In the midst of that, or sort of towards the tail end of that, um, the British Nationality Act uh, sort of formalizes this category of, of, of British subject. Um, what it what essentially does um, is acknowledge that um, colonial subjects, you know, in the Caribbean and elsewhere are also under the British crown and therefore, you know, the implication of that is they have, you know, they're able to travel to the UK without a separate, they don't need a separate passport, they are British citizens, British subjects. Um, and so this is what leads to the Empire Windrush and all the, you know, there's all this other uh, uh, migration from the Caribbean um, to Britain. Racial violence, the job competition, contracting uh, British, British economy in the late 50s, early 1960s, uh, eventually leads to immigration restrictions in the UK in 1962. So you have a period from about 48 to 62 
pretty extensive Caribbean, about 200,000 or so um, Caribbean uh, migrants to the UK. 62 is restricted in, in the UK. 65, the great immigration liberalization in the US that opens up finally um, that kind of second wave, if you will, of Caribbean, Jamaican and broader Caribbean immigration to the US. Is that so? So you have you know, some Jamaicans, of course, who were here you know, early in the 20th century, in the teens and 20s, um, a very small number you know, up, through, up, up until the mid-60s, and then an explosion in the late 60s and early 70s you know, that sort of continues more or less into the 90s. Um, and of course, New York and Brooklyn in particular becomes the, becomes the kind of heart of that community. Um, a little bit later, it's sort of uh, New York and Miami together, are really, the, the two largest Jamaican populations outside of Jamaica. All right, let's wrap up just talking a little about teaching because I know we're, we're late on time. Um, but I just want to sh share a couple other sources um, that might be useful if this works. Um, so one of these is uh, the site Digital Harlem. I don't know if, if, this was sh if you've encountered this before or not. This is a um, Digital Harlem, Everyday Life, 1915 to 1930. This is a set of historians, um, all Australian, um, strangely enough, um, who um, uh, engage in this you know, kind of long-term, um, uh, really deep, rich study of Harlem um, that has spawned a number of different books um, and importantly, and articles, and importantly, this, this website, which is, which is uh, digitalharlem.org. Um, They've used census data. Um, they've used, uh, obviously, they're, they're, they're mapped it. Um, and they've also used um, police records, arrest records. Uh, I think those are the two largest uh, sets of data. Um, but there are, other, there are other sources. I'm not, I'm not, I don't know, actually, off the top, uh, all the other uh, sources. But in any case, uh, how, how this is useful to you. Um, this may be useful to you for, uh, for your research, but I think it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a neat teaching um, uh, tool. Um, so what the, what the site allows you to do, again, this is good, one neighborhood, 15 years. So it's, you know, it has its limitations within that. But of course, we know the significance of Harlem during this period. Um, and so um, it, you can search for particular kinds of events um, from Again, because they use so much of this um, um, uh, police data, um, and involves lots of kinds of, you know, uh, assaults, burglaries, purse snatchings, and, and things like that. But also, um, um, things like, let's say, parades. So I just select parade. I'm not going to set any parameters. We'll just kind of do this quickly, if we can. Okay. And then, so I just selected parade. You know, it searches the entire database. It comes up with 17 instances of parades um, and maps them onto onto the map. Uh, and then, if you click on any one of them, um, it will give you some data da, 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 on what it was. So you have the the anniversary of the Elks Lodge. I'm trying to find there's a UNIA or multiple UNIA um, events. There you go. Parade of the Third Convention of the of the United Negro Improvement Association. Right. And so it's, again, it plots it onto the map. Um, so you can look at events. You can look at at uh, people. You can also look for. Um, particular kinds of places. So maybe you're interested in um, black beauty culture, right? Beauty parlors. 200 beauty parlors. So we might want to condense that, but we'll just. Right, and you sort of, you get the, you get the gist of it. Um, so, yes. Google map, right? the, yeah, the, the underlying map is, is just Google Maps, right. right? We were talking earlier this morning about this, how in fortunate that it places like much of New York, the geography hasn't changed that much. Exactly. You can overlay a contemporary map. Yep. I mean, except that this has the interstate on it, which clearly did not exist. Right. Uh, up to 1930. 
1915 and 1930. Yep. Yeah, it's taking a 2015 map of the city. Um, but as you say, you know, the street grid has not changed, you know, in the last century, essentially. So you can, you know, uh, and more or less, you know, some street names have changed, of course, right? So Malcolm X Boulevard, Lenox, you know, Lenox Avenue, that kind of thing. There are some changes, and I don't know how they account for that necessarily in here. Um, but by and large, right, if you're, if you're looking for a particular address, 535 St. Nicholas, right, it's, it's, still, it's still there. So it's really useful for that. Um, there's, a, there's an accompanying blog which I don't think has been updated in some years, but um, nice. Which is kind of a, it's just um, helpful to kind of navigate. It gives you some 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 sense of the kinds of work that you can do. Um, I think it links to some research um, articles and things that have been produced out of the databases and so forth. So. Um, yeah, I think you can sort of figure out a little bit or get a sense at least of what you might be able to use this for and, and, and you know, I invite you to, to play with it a little bit. I actually haven't used it at all for my own work, but um, um, in part because of my focus on Brooklyn, uh, but I have used it a little bit with students. So in terms of Brooklyn history, um, and again, Professor Purnell, my, my, my good friend, will probably talk to you a little bit more about this. And he's, a, he's an incredible historian of Brooklyn. He's from Brooklyn and has written this amazing book about civil rights there. So he'll talk to you probably uh, quite a bit about the kind of archival sources that are there. But two of the main um, repositories for Brooklyn history are the Brooklyn Historical Society, which is located in downtown Brooklyn. Um, I think it's brooklynhistory.org. Um, and the Brooklyn Public Library, their central branch um, uh, their main branch, which is located near Grand Army Plaza in Brooklyn, um, and they have at the at the central branch what they call the Brooklyn Collection, uh, which is basically a, a, a smallish room um, that has all kinds of clippings, newspaper clippings, has photographs, um, has various kinds of publications, all books you know, published about Brooklyn, some theses and dissertations, and so forth. Um, the Brooklyn Historical Society has a very for, for the beauty and the, and, the, and the kind of depth of their collection has almost nothing online. And they have like, they, they advertise like 4,000 photographs. That 4,000, that sounds like a lot, but you know, they have tens of thousands of photographs in their collection, so it's really just a small drop. So uh, they do have a finding aid that you can use through brooklynhistory.org um, uh, that's connected to um, the kind of, to connected to NYU, actually NYU's um, catalog. So if you want to search just to see if they have certain kinds of materials, um, I have not used their collections much because they don't, to be frank, have a great deal of stuff on African Americans or black folks in Brooklyn. They have some stuff, depending on what you're looking for, but not a ton. Uh, but I found much more useful and much more material um, at the, in the Brooklyn Historical, um, excuse me, the Brooklyn Collection at the Public Library. Uh, again, going in person is always better, but, but they do have a few things online. And one of the great things, and this is fairly recent, that they have is a fully digitized um, access to the Brooklyn Daily Eagle, which was the local newspaper um, from the mid-19th century up till 1955. Um, and the Brooklyn Daily Eagle is, it, you know, two things. I mean, Brooklyn Daily Eagle is not um, necessarily um, included in like ProQuest and other kinds of uh, research newspaper databases. Um, and, but this is this is, a, this is part of the public library. It's a public site. You don't need any affiliation. You can just go to the site, um, and and it's fully searchable. Um, and so, again, I don't have to, you know, take you through it. Um, too much, but you know, it's it's I think fun to play with a little bit to sort of see what comes up. So I just I searched for Calypso. I, I didn't. Well, let, let's narrow the date range a little bit. So um, well, early 20th century up through the end of uh, you know end of the run of the, the newspaper sort of. Doesn't stop publication fully, but basically ends in '55. Uh, this digital version. So, um, Calypso, you get all kinds of weird, wacky things. Um, some of which are useful. Um, you know, there's stuff that's not really useful at all. Um, A West Indian lady really did lay out her husband stone cold dead in Grass Market Trinidad and Brooklyn born Wilmoth Houdini, king of the Calypso singers, saw the crime and wrote a folk song about it. Um, so there's stuff that's just about, um, in this case, you know, Calypso performance broadly, 
but there's, there are some advertisements of some of those kinds of big Calypso shows that I, that, like the Daphne Weeks kind of stuff that I showed you before. There are reviews of performances, um, and there are just things, of course, with just the word Calypso in it that have nothing to do with the music, that, like the name of a ship or something. But, um, you know, again, because it's fully searchable by keyword, you know, you could put in, you know, probably anything um, and, and have some hope of finding something. And this, again, is, is useful for um, trying to decenter Harlem a little bit in, in terms of thinking about black New York in, in a broad sense. Um, I did, earlier just testing it out, I did a search for, for, for Negro and I got like 20,000 hits. And so um, you have to be a little bit more specific than that. But, um, you know, depending on what you're interested in, that might be a good source. Any last final questions, comments? It seems like um, earlier Calypso music uh, songs, the lyrics are heavy on themes of like longing and these political undertones and longing for home. And then you know you have um, Caribbean folks establishing in Brooklyn. And now with so much gentrification that's going on in Brooklyn, are Calypso artists now who've been pushed out? Like, are these themes reemerging? That's a great question. I don't. I don't know the answer. I haven't followed. I mean, so two things. I mean, one, I, I don't I haven't really followed. I don't follow contemporary calypso too much. But there's also uh, calypso itself as a musical form goes through a great transformation, uh, particularly in the 1970s, and in some ways is displaced by soca, which is the kind of you know upbeat, you know, kind of dance, you know, dance. It's not really proper to say, but a dance version of Calypso, a dance Calypso. Um, and so actually, you would actually look at Soka first, and then, I mean, they're still you know, kind of traditional Calypsonians, um, and the two sort of exist side by side, but, um, but that's also something to sort of think about. So part of, in, in telling the story over a period of decades, I also have to sort of think about how these genres, you know, change and transform and evolve. Um, there's, in, in, the, in the chapters on the 70s, uh, I, I, I write a bit about reggae, and the way that reggae comes to, comes to symbolize a kind of um, Caribbean youth culture, and, and in some ways a black, global black youth culture, and the difficulties that presents uh, for people who are not Jamaican, right? For example, Trinidadians, that's not our music, but maybe it is. Um, African Americans, you know, some are hostile, some are open, you know, all that kind of stuff. So, um, so, that, so part of the answer is go to Soka, not Calypso. The other part of the answer is I don't know. <laughs> I couldn't help but make a connection between the song London is the Place for Me, mm -hmm. which is from the 1950s. Yes. And then Joshua McCarter Simpson's Old Liberia is not the place for me from the 1850s mm. um, when they were trying to repatriate black Americans to Liberia. That was the song to say, America's my home. And then you have these migrants who are now claiming London as their home. Right. And so the way in which space and place meanings get unpacked mm -hmm. um, based on, I guess, what the context is. Mm -hmm. And I would be curious to see what kind of trajectory there is between the two, because it sounds almost as if, I mean, it's a hundred years between yeah. them that they're speaking to each other, you know? So it's just, it just came to me as yeah. I was thinking about the song for London mm -hmm. and then the song for Liberia, and one is protest <coughs> and one is affirmative. Mm -hmm. Sounds like a great research project. Yeah, I, know. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, the politics of place are all through this music. Um, you know, I played the, the, the Lord Invader Brooklyn, Brooklyn. He has another song, Chicago, Chicago. It's actually not that different. <laughs> um, you know, Kitchener, uh, who's Trinidadian, does a song about Ghana. He also does a song about Jamaica, a couple songs, several songs about Jamaica. I mean, there's a way in which you place references to place have all kinds of different valences and, 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 and also obviously mean different things in different, you know, where, when they're heard or performed in different places. All right. Thank you all.